get into it. What are actionable signals? What makes them actionable? Should the, should the conditions we describe be true, the probability is high that it will work. So this is like the coin toss analogy. It's not always going to work, but we're stacking the odds in our favor. And the way that that analogy works is that if I give you a coin, and it's not a trick coin, it's a regular coin, and I tell you, I'll pay you $300 every time it lands on tails, and you pay me $100 every time it lands on heads, what would you want to do with that coin? Flip it as many times as possible, right? Because you know that the odds are 50-50 it's going to land heads or tails. And on a long enough timeline, you flip it, uh, you flip it enough times, it will eventually even out and be 50-50. So if half the time you're making $300 and the other half the time you're making $100, the odds are in your favor and you want to flip that thing as much as possible. So what we do with actionable signals is we help to stack the odds in our favor because we understand the conditions that make them form. So let's start with the actionable signal that is the hammer reversal, okay? This is an actionable signal, not a universal truth, because we can't quantify why it happens, okay? I'll get into that in a minute, but for now, we observe that the hammer is um, happens at the bottom of a long trend, or a trend. So it happens here, it, it, I want you to know that it happens at a pivot. And usually the body of the hammer, the open and the close, are in the top third of the body. The reversal goes in force, as is the case here, when the new bar, we have to wait for it to finish forming, because this can always go three. Remember, this just came back. Maybe it bounced off the bottom of a try or something, right? So we wait for this to finish forming, and then on this bar, when it go, we go long when we break above the high of the hammer, and we expect that to work, because this is seller exhaustion, combined, uh, and, and um, there's this pullback, and uh, we'll get into why we expect it to work in a minute. But let's talk about hammer continuation, which is sort of the same deal, but instead of a reversal, it price continues, right? So this is a momentum hammer. Forms near the highs of a, of a previous strong uptrend. Okay, we see that there. There it is. And it goes in force above the high of the hammer. Okay, so the rationale is the strong uptrend meets a minor profit-taking pullback combined with ill-timed shorts. So that's what you see here is the pullback in the wick. So anytime we see these types of wicks, we're, we're seeing a combination of exhaustion and ill-timed entries. That's kind of the rationale behind these. what makes these types of signals, whether it's the, the hammer reversal or the momentum hammer, or the shooting star reversal, that's what makes them work. Uh, this shooting star reversal forms after a previous uptrend or pivot, same deal, pivot. It's the opposite of a hammer. Um, signals a reversal off the highs. So we go to the highs and we reversed, and we see that with the uh, buyer exhaustion and the pullback, there's that wick. Same as the hammer, we need um, we, we define the hammer and the star similarly. The, the uh, body is, in this case, in the lower third of the uh, candle, okay? Um, it is enforced below the low of the star candle, just like the hammer. We wait for it to form. The next candle goes in force once it breaks below the low of that uh, star candle. And it's a similar rationale as the hammer. Exhaustion of one side, ill-timed entrance of the other. The shooting star continuation, or Momo star, occurs on the lows of a previous strong downtrend. So notice here with the, it's uh, similar to the momentum hammer. There's a strong trend, and it forms at the highs of the trend. And it goes in force below the low of the candle. That's what happened here. Rationale, strong trend combined with a minor pullback. So it's kind of like a pause. And we see that um, in another instance of an actionable signal called a measured move. Um, we'll get into that in a minute. Slightly different uh, definition. Kicking bull or bullish kicker. So the previous bar is red. That's this bar. And you see that the body, the open, the open is at least 80% of the, of the, of 
of the candle is is the body where all of the the anybody who was long here got slaughtered okay oh go back over here sorry and it was countered by a gap up above the entire previous range so here you have the shorts are in control anybody selling is in control Longs are getting slaughtered, right? And then the next period opens above, completely above the previous range. So it's a gap in a way and continues. What does this do? It traps the shorts and there are new buyers that come in. So now the shorts have to cover because remember they closed here. So they're all the way here trapped. They have to cover. There's new buyers. There's natural buyers. That's why that works. Kicking bear, same exact situation except in the opposite direction. So this one would be green, that one would be red, and it would be down here. Universal versus actionable. An actionable signal is based on a strong probability. Remember, the coin toss analogy, anything that stacks the odds in your favor. We have a rationale, we can explain it, but we can't quantify it. A universal truth, however, is irrefutable. Hammers and stars are actionable signals, but they're not universal truths. We suspect, but we can't confirm why they form. Inside breaks and rev, and rev strats are universal truths. What's an inside break? My favorite actionable signal. Universal truth because it cannot be refuted that an equilibrium has formed. One side breaks. The equilibrium is broken. That side is controlled. We'll talk about the four C's later can be countered by a stronger force. That's what happens in a rev strat. We'll explain later. It's a period of equilibrium followed by expansion. So there was a range that was completely inside the previous range, and now we are breaking out of that range. So we're expanding in one direction or the other, or both, as in the case of the rev strat. It is in force as long as price stays outside the initial inside range. So here's an inside bar completely inside the previous range okay when this breaks notice we we didn't break immediately we were still inside that inside range when this breaks to the upside that becomes actionable and remains in force as long as price is above the open of the inside range an inside range an inside bar is a period of relative consolidation uh, well, it is consolidation, but it's a period of relative equilibrium um, because the range could still be massive. If you watch the part one video where there was uh, the example of GME that ran, I think, from 80-something to 140-something, and it was still an inside day. So this is taken, when we say equilibrium, we're, we're referring to in, in relativity, in, in relation to the other... Um, to the other time frames, to the other periods. So ex in example, in, in here, in this period, we have a longer uh, candle. There's more range. This is smaller range, and it's entirely inside of this range. So this represents equilibrium. Um, if we try to trade inside of an inside bar, we're going to get chopped up, right? We have to wait for this to form before we can um, take the signal, just like the hammers and the stars, okay? Retracement versus continuation. If the bar previous to an actionable signal is green and the actual, actionable signal is in the upper half of the body of that candle, it's considered continuation. If the, We'll see that with like the measured move in a minute. If the bar previous to the actionable signal is red and the actionable signal breaks to the upside, it's a retracement. Why does that matter? Because when we look at range, in this case, we're retracing here, for example, because we're, we're going back through previous range. Now, I don't know. That might be the high. If that was the case, if that was the high and we did a little pullback and now we're continuing to go higher, as we continue, there is a risk of exhaustion and so forth. And if we go back through previous range, there's also the risk of mother bar problems and whatnot. So we do need to be aware of when when there's an action when an actionable signal 
um, is telling you that there's a retracement or versus when there's actual continuation. And we trade those differently. This goes back to the broadening formation discussion. You know, a retracement is something where you look for an actionable signal off the bottom of a triangle. Once you've already established, you know, some pretty significant range where you're not going to get chopped up at the beginning of the broadening formation. And then if you catch that ac actionable signal back through that previous range, and that's a retracement. If you happen to catch it into full time frame continuity, like on a flip, which we'll talk about in a minute, then, you know, then you got a good trade. Like, like Rob says, we look for that kind of trade because we take, we can create a winning position with relatively low risk that we can then build on by adding into full time frame continuity. What does he mean by that? Well, continuation. So if we get an actionable signal that, is continuing that's that's continuing to take the price into full time frame continuity that's where we would want to maybe add or if there's some exhaustion risk we'll talk about that some later um maybe start to scale back and so on but that's all going to help you manage your trade and de and develop your trade to begin with inside bar setups so the bias depends on the mother bar situation if you remember the discussion we did in in the part one video a mother bar and then its subsequent inside bar range, it, 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 if the, the larger the mother bar, the harder it's going to be to break out of that range. And, it's, and, you know, if you're, for example, if you're on the low side of that range with an inside bar setup and you're expecting to play it long, you know, you're, you, you run the risk that you're going to, you've got a whole lot of previous range to go through. And if you run into some consolidation and whatnot in the middle, you know, price could reverse and come back to the bottom. So those are the, those are the types of situation where you need to know where you're trading in relation to the mother bar. If you have an inside bar setup, right. And keep in mind that a mother bar could be an outside bar or it could be a, a, a two, it, you know, it, it's just any bar that is previous to an inside bar. So again, we avoid trading inside an inside bar have to wait for it to form and then we can trigger this can be the beginning of price discovery as range expands creating a broadening formation we discussed that in part one video we said do we want to be there when it's starting no we want to draw our broadening formations off of older highs and lows so that we're sure that we have we're not as choppy we have more range and then we can we can determine direction using something like a reversal and time frame analysis so keep in mind that inside bar setups could be the beginning of some broadening formations, and they could be choppy. You could expect a rev strat in that type of situation, a two-bar rev strat. So there, there is first an inside bar, followed by a two in one direction, and then a two in the opposite direction. So we have an inside bar, followed by a two in one direction and then a two in the opposite direction, okay? Um, and we notice that a lot of the times the first two is a hammer as the break of the equilibrium was attempted, met by a stronger force, and then receded back into the inside range, okay? It takes three bars to happen. One, one, two, three. And you'll see a hammer or a star. We talked about that. We talked about the wick. Leaves behind a wick once it recedes back into the inside range. So demonstrating that neither buyers nor sellers are in control again. They, they're struggling for control. A one-bar rev strat is the same idea as a two-bar rev strat, except it happened if these two bars were one bar all by themselves, if this happened faster than it did here, then you'd have a one-bar rev strat. So it can happen in the single candle following an inside bar. So basically it's a one followed by a three. It's different from just any outside bar. And we discussed some of this on, on Twitter because it happens after a period of consolidation. And that is an inside break. That's already an actionable signal in, one dire in, in the direction of the break. If it reverses, like in the one bar ref stat and breaks in the opposite direction, it's still actionable in the opposite direction. Just keep in mind, the previous admonitions. And we can answer the question of who is in control due to the break of equilibrium, which is then reversed. That cannot be disputed. It is a broadening formation. We have a one and then we have a three. So we took out the high and the low. There's a high to a higher high, a low to a lower low. By definition, 
a broadening formation is occurring when there's a two 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 bar red strat or a one bar red strat. If they buy it up and sell it down once, they might do it again. And Rob talks about that all the time. Measured move, that's another actionable signal. It's like a brief pause before a strong trend continues. It's called a measured move because we gauge the magnitude of the previous move and anticipate that the continuation will be of equal strength. Same basic rationale as the other continuation place. Ill-timed entries during a strong trend. Notice, trend. Trend is your friend. We keep coming back to that, right? How are we going to know when something is trending? When in doubt, zoom out. When they trigger matters. The sooner they trigger, the more time for the trade to work out, but also for it to not work out and go rev strat or something. So keep that in mind. There could be time exhaustion. If it happens late in the day, if it happens late during the period, there's not going to be any time for that trade to play out. You know, it could set up. We're going to have, if we have a flip, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, we could see a change of control and that play may just be completely invalid. Our thesis might be invalid. If they trigger too soon in the process of price discovery, we talked about that, there could be chop. And this is an interesting discussion that I had on Facebook and I've been having elsewhere. They gain significance as time frames increase or volatility increases. So if we're trying to establish where's the trend, is it moving up, is it down, is it sideways or whatever, and we zoom out to the hourly, we're going to see one picture, and then we zoom out to the daily, and then the weekly and the monthly, we're going to see a different picture. And the farther out we zoom, the clearer it becomes where the trend is and who's in control. So an actionable signal on whatever that time frame is is, uh, is clearly going to be more significant. However, you have to wait that entire time frame for it to happen. Conversely, if there's a period of high volatility – then the shorter time frames become more significant. And I use the analogy of a reversal on a one-minute chart in a low beta stock during a upward grind is, um, you know, it's, 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 it's meaningless. But a, re but a reversal or an actionable signal on a one-minute chart uh, of, a, of a low float runner that just went parabolic and halted is already too late. So you see why they gain significance as the time frames increase or as volatility increases. And that's for anything. That's a reversal. That's an actionable signal. Um, that's for, for anything. So now we're going to talk about time frame continuity. Okay. Participation groups. We're going to talk about the flip and we're going to talk about the coupling. So participation groups. Participants that are represented by the various time frames. So think of like day trading, swing trading, scalping, long-term investing. You're going to be using various different time frames. Um, for example, Rob talks about I think the monthly is the institutional group, or we take into account um, you know openings on the quarterly and whatnot. Uh, so we can separate them by price and time because of the univer universal truths that are the high, the low, the open, and the close. And since each time frame has a high, a low, an open, and a close. When we analyze, when we do our time frame analysis, we can pick them apart and decide who's participating, uh, who's in control in each different participation group. But we need time to pass in order to identify the groups, and we prefer to have four separate openings. Rob says we don't wait until there's four separate openings, but the more openings we have, the more quantifiable evidence that we have of who is in control at any given time. Oops. Um, anytime the monthly, the weekly, the daily, and the hourly are all red, the algos are hitting the bits. Conversely, when they're all green, they're slapping that ask. So how do we see that? Well, there's two ways to see it. We have we can have a flex grid, like what I have here. And, and we actually would need like two. You can do these two flex grids. I do two because I think four is plenty for a flex grid on my little laptop, but you can do all the time frames that we use in the strat. And keep in mind that in the strat, we use the five minute, the 15 minute, the 30 minute, the one hour, the daily, the weekly, the monthly, the yearly. Some people use the quarterly. Rob talks about the quarterly um, all the time. And so with these flex grids, once you've got these flex grids up, then you can tell 
Anytime the monthly, weekly, daily, hourly are all red, the algos are hitting the bid. So if the, well, especially here we have the yearly is green. The monthly is green. The weekly is green. The daily is red. Okay, we have conflict on the day. Let's pretend that the daily is green. And let's pretend that at the candle, the, the most recent candle on every single uh, other time frame here is green. That means that they're slapping that ass. They are hitting the offer. They are buying it right now. They're buying it aggressively. They're buying it um, immediately. So um, they're buying it this year. They're buying it this month, this week, today, all the way down to the five minute or whatever the time frame is. As far up or down as you have continuity, they are continuing to buy it or sell it. Um, and so that's what that means. So if, if they're all the same color, they're continuing, they're, they're buying it now and they're continuing to buy it now if it's all green and they're selling it now and they're continuing to sell it now if it's all red. Okay, <clears throat> so how do we know if a candle is green or red? Well, if the close or the current price is above or below the open. If it opens above the close, the candle's red. If the close is below the open, the candle is green. If it went up from the from where it opened. So the level that it opens is, first of all, a universal truth. It's irrefutable, cannot be disputed. Once it happens, it happens. That's it. But it's also an important level because in order for there to be continuity across all the time frames, where's the, let's see here, move that over here. In order for there to be continuity across all the time frames, price has to be above the open on all the time frames. And so if there were conflict where there's a pullback or something and price goes below the open on any one of the time frames, probably starting on some of these lower time frames, we have to wait for price to go and get above the highest open in order for there to be continuity to the upside. And we can look at continuity on different levels depending on what your participation group is. If you're participating on a long-term basis, if you're swinging, then you should probably look all the way up to the yearly, maybe uh, the monthly, the weekly, the daily for sure. And you would look into a lower time frame to maybe start to catch some reversals back into time frame continuity. If you're day trading, it's possible that even the five minute is a little too long. If there's a lot of volatility, which I wouldn't recommend for any beginner, but um, if that's the case, then the five minute might be too long. So we use the intraday time frames, the 15 minute, the 30 minute, the 60 minute, and we, we only consider continuity on the intraday time frames because we're not going to hold long enough for any of this to matter. So we do need to answer which participation group are we. And um, <clears throat> again, there's no other explanation. If they're all red, they have to be se all selling it right now. If they're all green, they have to be all buying it right now. And for more reading on this subject, I recommend the Algorithmic Price Action Trading Strategies by Rob Smith. There is a link in the slideshow, and I intend to share the slideshow everywhere. Um, let's go on to the next one, the flip. So this is every time there's a new hour, okay? Now, Rob says that we should aggregate at the bottom of the hour. Uh, so at the bottom of the hour, think of a clock with the uh, minute hands. When the minute hand points to the 30, that's the bottom of the hour, in case you had trouble knowing that. That, had, that actually looked, I had to look that up the first time I heard that. It was, which one's the bottom? Okay, yeah. So the top is when all the, all the hands point to the top. So 8 o'clock is top of the hour, but that's not when the market opens. The, the market actually opens at 8.30. Okay, now here I have ES. Um, where you aggregate matters because it's going to change the way the scenarios look. You're not going to see any of the pre, uh, pre-market stuff that's happening. Right. Um, and so that, that, that matters. And Rob recommends that we open at the bottom because the opening, um, the opening starts at the bottom of the hour, as does the Euro market close and several other important liquidity events, such as weekly oil and natural gas numbers, et cetera. So the flip at the bottom of the hour is significant. Whether you choose to aggregate on the bottom of the hour or not, the flip at the bottom of the hour is something you need to be aware of because you need to start looking for actionable signals that set up your trades around that time, around that period of time, because that's when you're also going to confirm continuity 
or if there's going to be conflict, perhaps go in the opposite direction, like we talked about with retracements and whatnot. So the 60-minute group is very important, as it will determine who is in control. Now, when the 60-minute and the daily are confirming, they override the weekly and the monthly for control. Inside of each one of these overlays, there's an in, there's a hourly candle, okay? If it's this week right here, for example, at this time, at this moment, before any of this happened, right here, it was red for the week, and it had been red since the previous week. We were in a downtrend, okay? But as soon as there was a re first a reversal happened on the shorter time frames, and we see that the even I know it's all squished in there, but take my word for it, the hours reversed at some point. There was a three in there somehow with the reversals. Maybe it was a three two two. I don't know. But at the moment when we went above the open on the daily, and we were above the open on the hourly, we didn't have to get above the open on the weekly to know who is in control right now. The buyers are in control because when the 60 and the daily are in agreement, they override the weekly and the monthly for control. In this case, it was uh, they're switching hands back to con con confirmation. Here, we we're not overriding anything. We're confirming continuity to the upside because we are above the open on the monthly. I need to take a moment to explain what you're looking at here. This is a, a chart that I developed. Um, it's one of my many scripts that are available on usethinkscript.com. And I have two of them. I have an intraday and I have the full time frames. On the intraday chart, we see it's a minute chart and we see overlays for five minute candles, 15 minute candles. Come on. That's a 15 minute candle overlay. 30-minute candles, and one hour. The bigger the overlay, the larger the time frame. These overlays don't, sh don't show you the shape of the candle, but they do tell you where it opens. So that five-minute period opened right there. It's red because it closed below the open. And they also tell you the high and the low. So we can, we can use these to determine what the scenarios are on all of these time frames. For example, this was a two something, maybe a three, and then a one, and then another one, and then a two down, two down, one, two up, two down, two down doji, because it closed in the same place where it opened, two down, two down, and on the 15ers, two down, two down, two down, two down, one, if it'll highlight again, one, two up. So you see how we can see the re we can see reversals, we can see scenarios, we see the opens. Unlike this, in this situation, if we want to know where the opens are on these time frames, we actually have to like zoom in and draw where did it open. So it'll show up on all the other charts. When we look at this chart. We need to know where that opened. So, like, let's say, for example, um, we want to know where 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 the daily opened. Okay, we actually have to do this. Hello. Zoom in here. Maybe even stretch it out a little so we get some more uh, some more precise uh, drawing. You know, and then we still have to go in there, and we still have to put in our drawing and do this. Again, I'm sorry, my computer's so slow. And then we go up here, you know, and we do the drawing there. Right? And that's the open. And then we close down there. And now you see it across all the other time frames. And, for example, on some of these smaller time frames, you have to zoom out or zoom in if you want to see it. But it'll be there. Whoa, I think I just wrote on something. Well, there it is, actually, right there. Okay? So if you want to see it, and then it'll show up in a different – it'll show up wherever you drew it and whatnot. And so it – I started to play around with different alternatives for how I could show time frame continuity in a way that I could see it all at once and know where all of the opens are, or at least the highest and the lowest open at any given time. Keeping in mind that the highest open is the beginning of time frame continuity to the upside, and the lowest open 
is the beginning of time frame continuity to the downside. And I went through several iterations, and if you've gone through my page, you've seen a lot of them. There were these lines that went all the way across the screen. There were lines that came out from the right and whatnot. But really, I think that the best tool for seeing time frame continuity is by far um, these overlays. Let me close this out here. Um, so these overlays, because you can see the scenarios, because you can see the opens on all of those levels, because you can see with another study that I have on here um, called time frame continuity, you can see where time frame continuity to the upside begins and where it begins to the downside. You can zoom out and see the whole shebang all at once. You can look inside the time frames, the higher time frames, and you can see the guts of the thing as it triangles out and forms broadening formations and everything. You can see how it all plays out from the inside out. It's kind of like with the um, the ending credits of that movie, uh, the, the, the Men in Black movie, where they keep zooming out, zooming out, zooming out. That's what you're seeing here. So you're seeing all these other time frames on the higher time frames, and then if you zoom in, you see the smaller time frames. <laughs> A word of uh, caution for those of you who loaded my charts, be sure that when you read this up here, 5, 15, 30, one hour, that this is in order and that it starts from five and it ends in, in the, the smallest to the highest. Because if not, then it will affect how well they highlight when you over when you hover over that time frame. So make sure it's it's it starts with the five minute, it starts with the lowest and ends with the highest. And if not, you can move stuff around, you can move the order of the studies by clicking on these little items here. Um, so that matters when, when you load the, the candles, if you make any edits to your studies and you end up putting these in the, in the wrong order, they're not going to highlight the way they're supposed to when you hover over them. So keep that in mind when you load these charts, um, going back to what we were looking at with the actionable signal. So the flip again, the 60 is where they are confirming, um, I'm sorry, where the 60 and the daily are confirming the override, the weekly and the monthly for control. So we can extrapolate from that that we're going to see a change in continuity begin on lower time frames. That's going to signal who's in control, a change in who's in control as the direction of the stock changes. So the flip at the bottom of the hour will continue to confirm the daily for control or give control back to the 60 weekly and monthly if they're all in agreement. Let's look at this example. Look at this chart with what you know about these time frames okay this overlay chart and then i already went over what these overlays are so here we see a two two down uh on the one hour that's the large overlay and then a two two reversal on the hourly okay and at the end price was above the open on both of those hours and the colors of these overlays are these deep green um, colors that signal that price is in a strong trend moving upward where the majority of the time there was full time frame continuity to the upside. Keep in mind that the study that I, that I designed that draws these magenta and cyan lines is drawing these based on the rationale that I just explained. Where's the top and where's the bottom? Let me go through and show you a little bit of the code. So it finds the open for each one of these time frames. Anyways, it finds the open for each of these time frames, and then it says which one is the top and which one is the bottom. If the hour is higher than all the other time frames, then the hour is the the hour is the highest time frame. So if whichever open is the highest of all the time frames, that's the beginning of time frame continuity to the upside, and then whichever one is the bottom or the lowest of them all, that's the beginning to the downside. Then all it does is paint a horizontal line and make it cyan if it's up, magenta if it's down. That's why you see the position of that line. It moves around as um, each one of these time frames opens because the new open might be the highest open at that moment, or it might be the lowest open, or it might be the only open, which takes us back to the flip. The flip is the only open at that moment until it decouples. Now, at this moment in time, which here again, I'm aggregating at the top of the hour, so the flip is happening at the top of the hour. In reality, it's here, but because I'm aggregating here, we're opening here. 
So at this moment, this line is the open for this hour. And you see it remains that open all the way through the hour. That never changes. That's a universal truth. It is the open for this half hour. It remains the open all half hour long. It is the open for this 15 minute again. And this five minute there. So price being above that open could mean they're buying at this hour or this half hour or this 15 or, or this fiver. If we really want to get precise, we need to see another open. That's what happens here. So this is still not a decoupling because this open, though, is now different from the weekly and I'm sorry, the week. it's different from the hourly and the half hour and the 15 or it's a new fiver. It still shares. I mean, it's, it's sorry, 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 going back. Strike that, reverse it. It's different from this fiver, right? It's a different opening, mm -hmm. but it still is the same open for the weekly, the hour, and the half hour. And so, in order to get a completely new opening on all time frames, we actually have to wait until the next half hour. And now we have a new open on a five, a new open on a 15er, a new open on a half hour. And really, if we want the new the new open for the hour, happens on the next flip. So that's what that's where that whole discussion about the decoupling comes in. Because as these other time frames open, price will move above or below those opens and either confirm or change continuity. Here it's confirming. And as price continues to open above prior levels on each successive time frame, whatever the highest open is in effect at any given time is the beginning of full time frame continuity to the upside like here this is a monthly so this big square here is a month and then each one of these is a week and then those are days and we see this month which is the month of march opened on the monday and we had the same open for the Monday, for the day, for the week, and for the month, and for the hour, and for anything below that. And so we didn't get a different, we didn't get a decoupling until actually the second Tuesday, right? Because this is the first time that we get a new open for a week and a new open for a day. And at this point, we can pinpoint that the buyers were in control, and they had been in control, all week and all month. So we're confirming continuity to the upside. So when we look at this example, what do we observe? And, and we might have to zoom in. Again, we've mentioned that we see the two, two reversal on the hourly. If we're participating on the hourly, our trigger is here, right there. And we leave all of that on the table. And a 2-2 two, two is not an actionable signal. A 2-2 two, two is, is a reversal. Okay? It could also go the other way now, right? Like the Randy Jackson and whatnot if there's consolidation. So it, if we want to put, if we want to use the two, the, the hour bars to trade, to trigger the trade with price action, we need it to break the high of the previous hour. And if we wanted to invalidate our thesis with price action, just using the hourly bar because of this whole 2-2 two -two situation, then the low would be down here, and that's all of our exposure as well. So we need to go into smaller time frames. Okay. Now, what you see here as uh, appears to be a horizontal line that goes all the way across the screen is actually on a larger time frame, a broadening formation. It appears flat because I've zoomed in, but price above it or price beneath it, that's the arms of the triangle, the, the, the tops and the bottoms of the triangle. In this case, we're, we were at the bottom of a triangle that actually I drew across other uh, various time frames. We broke one level of support. Remember, the, the bottoms and the tops of the tries are support because support and, resist, support and resistance are diagonal, not horizontal. And we were expecting, for whatever reason, let's just say we, we hypothetically expected to be uh, reversing off the bottom of the try, right? If we wanted to do that, 
and and we wanted to use the hour we let, let's say we wanted to manage our trade with the hourly then a good idea would be not to wait for that to happen on the hourly but maybe wait for an actionable signal on a shorter time frame and in that case in, in that case we could have used the 2 1 2 signal that was given to us by the half hour before the hour happened see that so this is an inside bar on this block here is a half hour and it's completely inside of this other half hour so this and this other half hour was a two two down off the bottom of the try two down one two up that triggered there with a whole bunch of aggregate aggravation if you were using that you would have got stopped out if you're if you're arbitrarily placing your stops just based on your risk tolerance or whatever and you put it too close to that you see what's happening right we're going to test first then we're going to continue so <clears throat> that puts you in a better trade using the half hour than it would have been using the ha the, the hours because you got in sooner and you actually used an actionable signal in this case if you if you are participating on the half hours this particular actionable signal is, is a really good type of signal to use to trade because in relation to the other half hours the range here is relatively smaller it, it is after after all uh, consolidative equilibrium inside range so our stops uh, we can trigger the trade using price action the moment when it breaks to the upside and we have that inside break actionable signal and we can use a, a stop below the low of that candle because we're here now to invalidate our thesis because that's an actionable signal to the downside and it would have been a break of support so this is a great place to put a stop and have it not be too far away from where you would have triggered it if you were participating on the half hour and it would have been better if you wanted to trail a stop for example using an hourly to get in on that half hour but if you wanted to get in sooner than that then you have to go in on a smaller time frame and if we use the 15ers for example we would have seen a two two off the bottom of the try and you kind of have to zoom in a little i don't think i can do that but there's a two two on the fivers so that fiver entrance right there even though it's not an actionable signal and it's, and it's not the one it's still a lot smaller if you wanted to put your stop here and you can see how the two two on the fivers cascaded into a two two on the 15ers which became a two one two on the half hours and then a two two on the hourly into full time frame continuity why because right here is a flip and when that flip happens there is no highest and lowest open there is the only open right now which is this price moving above this full time frame continuity to the upside price moving below this Full time frame continuity to the downside, confirming the previous move. So this is a change in control on the flip that happened as a 2-2 two -two on the fivers cascaded into a 2-2 two -two on the 15ers, 2-1-2 two -one -two on the 30s that became the 2-2 two -two on the hours. The four C's. We've been talking all about them. Who's in control? Is there conflict? Does that conflict confirm or change continuity i want to show you a few more examples of some of these overlay charts and the reason i'm using these um these what do you call them slides rather than going and hunting for one here is because this will waste a lot of time if i'm trying to find examples here but we can go to charts and we can answer questions and look at charts later um i just want to get these examples out of the way let's talk about this here if you haven't already seen this, I've been posting this everywhere. Again, there's a flip and the beginning of full time frame continuity to the upside. Now, notice that this bar, this hour here, is a two up, but it's red because the hour opened here and closed here. So, for example, when the price was here, this, this whole hour bar was actually green. These overlays. That's a very important point that I need to mention. These overlays repaint 
but they repaint in exactly the same way that the time frames they represent repaint. So if a candle is going red on any time frame, it's going to make the color of the overlay that match that color. So here, for example, we see this this overlay is green. It's actually green. It's a 15 or that's green because price closed above it. There's a green open on it. We just saw it a minute ago. There it is, right? But if if I move my cursor away and I don't highlight it, you see how it actually appears red? Um, that's conflict, okay? And it's not a rich red like when there's a downtrend. It's a sickly red, sort of not really fully red. Not, that That's conflict, because it's it's this green overlay sitting underneath or on yeah underneath these other red overlays and that's why it appears that way. I kind of like it that, the the fact that it does that um, because then I can it's it's easier to see the trends especially like when you zoom out and you see conflict appears as sort of a sickly color and it always retraces into some sort of previous range. And now you've got mother bar issues and previous range and whatnot. And continuity is always this rich green, you know, color. So like there's a rich or a rich red color like there. So that's kind of why I left it that way. And I designed it on purpose to look like that. But don't let it fool you. Right now, for example, this is open. Okay. We're here. That's actually a green fiber, and if it goes above this, this little 15er is going to turn green, and if it goes above this, this will turn green, and if it goes above that, that'll turn the, the hour will turn green, and it'll be three up. So it does evolve as as the trade progresses. You know, something that looked one color will change, and now it's a different color. But that's just because the candles are changing color on those time frames, and the overlays are behaving in exactly the same way. So. Let's talk about, uh, let's look at some of those examples. So here, again, this is the beginning of full time frame continuity to the upside. There was there was a two up, but it was in conflict. And it resolved as a two, and if you, hopefully you can see it. It was a two, one, two on the fiver into full time frame continuity to the upside. That continued for two whole hours. And then there was a flip. And price moved below the only open. And there was full time frame continuity to the downside. Okay. If all you did, if all you ever learned about the strat is time frame continuity, you could be profitable if you learn to manage your risk. Because there will never be a situation if you get in on full time frame continuity to the upside, that you will not be in a trade that is that you will not be in a stock that is moving up for any significant period of time. It's impossible. And if you get out when there's full time frame continuity to the downside, you're never you're never going to be there for any lengthy drawdown or pullback. It's impossible. You might be in the trade for a little bit of conflict, and depending on where you entered and depending on how you're managing your trade, that conflict may represent a loss for you, or it may represent, you know, um, more exposure or whatever. But you can't be in a stock that is moving up for very long and not be in full time frame continuity to the upside. And the inverse is true for the downside. And this demonstrates the power of that. Even without looking at any other signal, no other scenarios, nothing but the highest and the lowest open at all times, did we go above it or below it? If that's all we look at, we would have got a great entrance and a great exit. And it coincided with a 2-1-2 two, two reversal on the fivers that went 3-1-2 on the 15ers that went barely a 3 on the 30. So 2 goes up. Um, 2 goes 3 that went 2 up on the hour. So you, you get the idea, right? So these are the reversals that when we say we want to catch actionable signals into full time frame continuity, for example, if there is um, an actionable signal somewhere in here while we're still in conflict on that one minute time frame that triggers full time frame continuity, get in there. So that's that's all just how you, you know, depends on how you choose to manage your trade and execute your trade in the first place. Look at this example. Here we have the higher time frames. We have a broadening formation happening as a rev strat. There was a period of consolidation that kept getting narrower. Two down, one, 
one. So several inside days in a row, two, two inside days in a row. That first broke in one direction, came back into the range of the inside bar. We suspect it will go three when it goes below the open of that day, which it did, and it did go three, and then it went in the opposite direction. At the beginning of price discovery, a rev strat that is a broadening formation by definition, high to a higher high, low to a lower low, in which you would have got chopped to bits there and there because you wanted to go long and you got stopped out. And if you were smart, you got stopped out when we went below the open. <laughs> if you wanted to wait, you got stopped out below there. So that, that took that huge loss. And then you thought, oh, we're going, we're, no, we're going short. Okay, we're going short. No, we're not. We're making the beginning of a triangle and you're getting chopped up. That's what I mean by some rap strats are actual bona fide reversals that take us into like some full time frame continuity situation where we get a big rip and some of them do this. So be aware. Um, this is why this goes back to part one video when we draw our broadening formations and everything. I'm always drawing them on small and time and high time frame. Sometimes I'll even draw them one candle at a time. Every time I see a three, I might draw a broadening formation. Um, and uh, let me see. I had another slide here. Look at this. This is this is actually an important point because Notice here that I'm aggregating it again. On, on, and if anybody's wondering, I do this because I want to see the formations in the pre-market. But I'm aware that the flip is actually here. Okay. And so even though I'm aggregating on the, the top of the hour, we can still see a very clean change in control at the flip. At, in this case, at the 1030 mark right there where there was full time frame continuity to the upside with some conflict and whatnot, you know. And then there was a full time frame continuity to the downside, except that because we're aggregating on the top of the hour, this whole period of what is otherwise continuity appears as conflict, uh, as does this. See? Why does this appear as conflict? Because the moment this went below the, the, the open, it made this bar and everything here look reddish. But if it was a clean break, like what we saw on, um, let me see here, on that first example, then it looks like this. We see the rich red and the rich green and a very clear change in control. But because we're aggregating, we're aggregating here, this looks like conflict. But... Again, if you're anticipating a change in direction, a change in control at the flip, the minute you start to see this and, and you see that this goes into full time frame continuity, if we aggregate it there and there's a reversal there, that's where you would want to get in, right? This is the open for the hour, the half hour, this 15 or in this fiver. As soon as price went above it, this became the lowest open and the beginning of full time frame continuity to the downside, intraday. Because here we don't we don't know about the daily, the weekly, the monthly. All we see here are intraday, right? Price went this far, made this open, went below it. If we can get above this again, this is the beginning of time frame continuity to the upside. Anything in between is conflict. And that goes back to the four C's. Is the chain is the conflict that we see going to result in a change in control? Or is it going to confirm continuity? Those are the answers that we're trying to, 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 to answer before we, we get into any trade. Will it result in a change in control or will it confirm continuity? More exposure equals more risk, but it also means more gains, right? So this isn't always going to work out this way. By the way, what you see here isn't, and I'll demonstrate it in the uh, overlays, but what you see here doesn't always happen like this. It, it happily did here. But when we, uh, let's say, for example, here's a flip, right? 1030, we anticipated a change in control. It happened. It happened with a 2-2 reversal. We could say, even though it's not an actionable signal, it's still a pretty good place to put a trade if we were trading off of the fivers because we had a triangle here somewhere, one of these.
horizontal um, on a daily or weekly or monthly. There's a triangle here. So I could put my, my stop below the bottom of that fiber. And even though it's not an actionable signal, it's still pretty close to my entrance and continuity and a reversal into full time frame continuity put me in the trade and continuity and continuation take me out of the trade. So price action confirms my thesis, price action invalidates my thesis. Now, if I want to use price action to manage the trade and I want to trade trail the lows of the fivers, where do I get stopped out? Remember, I got in there, and that's if I was lucky, and I got filled exactly where I wanted to, right? If I was trailing the bottom of the fivers, there's my trailing stop, right? There, 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 and this one breaks. So I would have got stopped out right there. Not much profit. As a matter of fact, might not have even been a win when you take into account things like slippage and whatnot, right? So do we want to trail on the same time frame that we entered? Especially if we did a good analysis and we're using, for example, the one hour. No, right? Because we're going to get stopped out a lot sooner than if, for example, here we were trailing the bottom of the 15ers. And you can see that there's the trailer, there's the trailer, there's the trailer, there's the trailer. You got stopped out there. So a much longer distance, more exposure because each 15 minute bar takes longer to happen. And there's more that could happen. This could go back. This could go three, you could lose, right? So you are you are more exposed, but you are also more exposed to continuation. If you're trailing, in this case, the bottom of the 15ers. If you're trailing the bottom of the half hours, you never got stopped out, or the one hours in this example. Now, that doesn't, again, that doesn't always play out that way. Um, if things are really, really volatile, it uh, it frequently does. Look at this here. Let's let's say we did a triangle here. We 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 drew our broadening formation based on whatever back here, okay? And we got in on one of these flips here into full time frame continuity. If we had been trailing the bottom of the what are these five minutes, we would have got stopped out there. If we had been trailing the bottom of the fifteeners, we would have got stopped out there. We also would have got stopped out there if we'd been trailing the bottom of the half hours. So you see what I mean about exposure? If you're trailing the 15ers, that's your exposure, the 15ers. If you're trailing the half hours, well, now our stop is here. And we are exposed to this much loss or, yeah, loss. I mean, drawback, drawdown, whatever, you know. If you got in the trade at the opportune time here, though, do you really care about this too much? No, right? Because if you're if if you're in here and you get this little actionable signal here, look at this. Two, one, two. Inside break. And look how it ran after it broke that consolidated period. An inside break into full time frame continuity? Not yet, because that's the highest open right now, right? Previous range, add into full time frame continuity there. And if we're trailing the 15ers, like I said, we would have got stopped out. If we were trailing the half hour, we would have got stopped out. If we were trailing the hourly, though, we would have made it this far. So, again, and at, at this time and at this time, all of this here made this hour bar look green. But then it closed and, you know, went below. So, again, exposure, you know. An hour, this hour right here could have easily done what this half hour did or whatever it was that, that went three or that went down like that, you know, and gone this way and you would have been exposed. If you wanted to trail that that hour, the bottom of this hour, you would have been exposed to all of that loss. So keep in mind that when you see these long moves like this, there's exhaustion risk. There could be some consolidation at the top and whatnot. But if you have a full, if you have continuity and you have an actionable signal back into previous range or full time frame continuity that's where you can add um so let me see if there's any questions